happy February and well done to all you red January runners give yourself a pat on the back it's harder than it sounds and I couldn't do it I don't know <laughs> what it is what is red January I think oh told- run every day January there was a run every day December and an hour run every day January and I think I started and failed both <laughs> But yeah, fingers crossed you all, all you self-employed people out there got your tax returns done and submitted and paid on time and you can now relax until January 31st. 2024. Hello everybody and welcome to episode 8 of Tea and Trails. This week we have a catch up. I'm still alive. I'm so much better than last week. I think yeah. you hear my voice. <laughs> there is a lilting sound back to my voice. We chat to Dr. Uh, Siobhan Brennan all about menopause. Guys, do not turn off. Do not flick over this podcast. It's as important for men as women uh, to educate yourself on what happens to us ladies as we approach a finer age. Really interesting. Uh, I learned lots and uh and also reinforced a few things as well knowledge is always power so i hope you enjoy that interview if you haven't entered our lucky competition as well we'll prompt to remind you to that but first of all gary are you back are you training is this another week of sandbagging <laughs> what's the new well, i didn't do well the deets the deets for the week the i did deets. 71 miles so that's whoa, whoa. yeah you know, but totally oh, so last week, that's a bit of a jump up from three. You can, you know, if you do doubles, it, it doesn't take much before you start racking up the miles. And then a bit of a long run on the weekend. Um, so yeah, 71 miles. So Dragon's back training has officially started. I did a couple of strength sessions. No quality running sessions, though, apart from some strides. I just didn't feel up to it. Whether the information is accurate or not, my heart rate variability is in the green now, which is good, but it was still in the God. unbalanced phase. Mileage, okay. For this time of year, for Dragon's Back, I think if you're doing a 71 mile week, you've definitely got somewhere to go. Are you, are you now Dragon's Back? Lakeland 100 is like just there as a entertainment club. <laughs> And it's well, this Dragon's Back. Dra- Dragon's Back, yeah, because it's such a big, scary goal. That is what I'm fully concentrating on. But I'd be lying if. I wasn't being a greedy runner and wanted to do well at Lakeland 100 too. And this training ultimately finishes the Lakeland 100 because I think I'll have too much damage after yeah. Lakeland 100. That yeah. What's the um, time between the two? End of July and beginning of September. Yeah, so, so I'm definitely not going to be doing anything for two weeks. Um, I think it's going to be walking and bike and maybe that last week just to remind my legs. Um, but then it's funny because you start a, this like weird taper but you're not tapering from anywhere because I've not run for probably two weeks. Well, it's, it's not ideal, but it is what yeah, it is. But but yeah, but as, as, you know, as a pretty experienced endurance athlete myself, <laughs> Gary, I getting to these start lines under-trained and hungry and fresh yeah. and with the bucket full is 100% the better way than the yeah. other way, as we've seen. Uh, who's in your tent, Gary? Wow, so we've got Robin and we've got Trish. I can't believe it. I've been super lucky. Uh, so, yeah, Ooh, both. There's going to be, like, because there's going to be no excuses. Those two girls are going to be up at the front end of the race. They're going to be kicking your butt. <laughs> Big time. We were like, what, 25 hours for the arc at the 100. So, Amazing. smoking what fast. What great tent mates. You're going to be getting back. They'll be. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Gary, <laughs> can we help you with it? <laughs> but, oh, that would be so much. I'm so got FOMO already. It's a bunch of us. It's not just those days. There's a bunch of us. Really it's not just group. you and two women. <laughs> <laughs> but I've already got um, snoring anxiety. So there's a bit of chatter around in the WhatsApp group. Are you a people. snorer? Is that... Well, only if I'm poorly. You know, if I'm, I have been snoring lately because I'm full of bloody Lovely. snot. But uh, generally speaking, no. And there was no complaints when I was sharing a room for the uh, Dragon's Back race. So, yeah, I think I'll be When fine. you were sharing a room for the Dragon's Back race? No. Sorry, no, no, uh, spine r- race on the, you, on the okay. checkpoint. You Probably because you didn't sleep very much because you spent <laughs> most of it hanging around. So, yeah, you know, I can't complain. 70 miles, I just need to add some structure. Today, uh, I feel loads better, actually. I think I did something. I think I did a, a mile that started with an eight for a change, which was... <laughs> oh, three evolved, Gary. I can only dream of that sort of pace. So we'll see. We'll see what this week holds. But I did make a planner uh, and I colour coordinated it on all because I am useless at basically doing what I should do when I'm supposed to be doing it. And I'll always favour the things I want to do. Okay. So I'm really trying to structure my week. I have this. Oh, today. yeah. Oh, wow, that's pretty good. Yesterday, yeah. Every morning when the kids are having their breakfast. Uh, 
I'll give you a quick flash. I write a list. Like I have home, a, a list for home, a list for work, and a list for training. And I. Yeah. Do you want to hear the excitement of some of this list, Gary? Don't home, worry. bins, pick up dog poos, <laughs> move it upstairs, kids' bathroom. That's all done. That was all done yesterday. Put away spine kit. That still hasn't happened. <laughs> <laughs> still out. Work, that all happened. Podcast. Oh, paid my taxes. Did that too. Hey. And a bit of training. So I do the same. I love it. I write it. And then I'm not allowed to sit down at the end of the day until I've at least done most of it. It's quite satisfying, isn't it? Ticking the list off. Uh, oh, I went to the GP. I think I mentioned the other week about my polyps, possibly having polyps. Polyps are fine. My chest sounded fine. That's a little annoying because sometimes it's not fine. I wanted him to say it's bronchial pneumonia. You need He's some tablets. <laughs> That's what I wanted him to say. So I'm a bit annoyed. There's no pathway to recovery apart from I'm just going to have to slowly get better. But it is positive that there's nothing major. Did you show your knee at the same time? Oh, I should have, shouldn't I? God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I should have done that. And what was awesome, uh, a few listeners reached out to me and they mentioned that they'd been using their Patreon perks. They've been to Sport Shoes and Active Root and use a discount code, which has then in turn paid for their Patreon membership. Remind so remind me of we... the discount codes, Gary, because you're oh. IC Patreon. Yeah, it's five pound off for Active Root if you spend fifteen pound. Um yes, and it's the... like a third off. My maths is correct. <laughs> you're, so, you're so sharp. The countdown corner for, for you. <laughs> <laughs> Ready? Uh, and what was the uh, 10% and free delivery? But, which is a bit annoying, it's not for international orders. On well, the it's not. Oh, because we said last week that it was. Oh, yeah, no. yeah, yeah. So that that is, yeah, get it's it a bit annoying. To, if you live internationally, get it sent to you, Gary, and you'll forward it on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't <laughs> volunteer me for, for, for that. 10% and then, pair of trainers if you're spending 150 quid on a pair of trainers well don't you go you're working like a trojan getting these codes from companies is like (laughs) is hard work it involves a lot of work so thanks gary thanks for doing that and thank you if you are a patron and if you're not a patron yet but you do love the podcast and there's been a ton of love for the podcast in the last week or so just have a little just go and check us out on patreon and just see if a couple of dollars a month which just helps uh keep the what do we say mics and lights the mic's on and the, light, the mic's hot and the light's on. Um, but, you know, you don't have to do it. It's not like you're signing up for a mortgage and it's a 25-year deal. <laughs> you, can, yeah, you can be a patron and you, think, <laughs> and you think, you know what, this is not for me. You can just uh, cancel it too. We won't judge. We, we'll just send you oh. dog poo in the post. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but the big thing that happened to me was a little incident with Rex, me, and a cyclist that resulted in the cyclist. He went down pretty hard, Eddie. It was a oh, no. an adrenaline That's, rush. Is this all? Is this a, got a happy ending before you tell the story? Or this sounds pretty harsh. I didn't stick around to see if he was okay, but only because he had friends with him. He wasn't on his. I didn't abandon. Oh him. my god, Gary! This is another side of you. Tell me what happened before I become judgmental. Well, don't make me laugh because it is. You know, he okay, was sorry. hurt. No, no. <laughs> I know. I chuckle. I do. Ch- I've got a nervous um, habit where I chuckle at awkward situations. So if I do chuckle. I don't actually mean it. I'm just uh, trying to gloss Are we over. Learn something from this. This anyway, so let's rewind. So Sunday morning, I uh, went for a very short run with Rex. I just took a lovely picture of the sunrise, which I shared on Instagram later that day. And uh, I looked behind me, and I saw a cyclist uh, coming towards me. I'm pretty courteous as a runner. I moved off the path, um, let the cyclist go past. Rex went nuts, like he always does. He always uh, barks. He lun- he does lunge for bikes from time to time. Uh, but he went past, no dramas. But you've got him on the knees, haven't you? Oh, 100%. Yeah, he's always on the knees. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we exchanged hellos. Uh, he cycled on his way. Started running again, but then I see another cyclist behind me. But this guy, he was taking ages. So I keep running. I must have looked over my shoulder about three or four times. And he wasn't uh, getting any... He just wasn't getting any closer. So personally, I do feel like I shouldn't have to give way to cyclists. But ultimately, I don't want to hurt somebody. And I really don't want Rex to go under the bike. And before I knew it, this guy was like right on my on me on the inside. He shouted something. Um, and that's when I noticed he was there. And I was just like, wait. <laughs> Rex, Rex lunged. This guy did a a kind of skid swerve and ultimately went over the handlebars and um, yeah, crashed down really hard. I think I went into shock because when I left the scene, my legs went to jelly and I couldn't run. I was uh, like, all the adrenaline rushed out of me, but I asked him if he was okay. 
he really didn't want to talk to me. <laughs> uh, he just totally blanked me. And then the guy who cycled off turned out he was his friend. And then he came back. And as soon as he was reunited with his friend, he was communicating, he was talking. Uh, he seemed okay, really sore and bashed up. But then I left the scene. Yeah, I, I, I'd be, I'm on the fence to think, obviously, it's not pleasant seeing anybody hurt themselves. Part of me thinks... It was his fault for not really assessing the situation, coming on too fast. Rex was on his lead. But then I do think, oh, God, I wish I'd just waited for a couple of minutes until he'd gone past then. Hindsight is always, you always, when you have an incident, I've had a few incidents like that out here. Because people ski down our tracks so fast and they come round corners as if it's like an open piece. Yeah. And I've had many incidents like dogs or kids and shouting. And afterwards, I'm always like slightly appalled at the way that I sometimes react in yeah. those stressful situations because I always err on the side of like instant uh, oh, yeah. response and then afterwards you think could have just handled that calmly well I used to be a, this is I've learned a lesson I used to be quite a militant runner and there's been there was one run one cyclist a local cyclist that I got to a point where I just stand in front of him so he had to stop um I'd kind of swerve in front of him deliberately because he had no respect for the surroundings. Yeah, it's and it was just respect, isn't it? That's the tough thing is when you feel that you're being like, well, hang on a sec, we're both, nobody has a right of way of this. Unless you're, I always think like a horse rider, I always give them the ultimate respect because yeah. I give them a big distance. I slow right down. I let them know I'm coming from, from behind because you do not want to spook somebody riding a horse. because You don't know what they're going to do. I don't know what a horse is going to do. I don't, you know, I don't know what um, a dog would do. Every dog's different. Um, so yeah, it was pretty stressful, and I'm still, you know, still chewing family... it over a bit. Oh wow, all oh, dear. I was... Sometimes like things like that happen, and then like they do, they do just remind you, you know, if that happens again, you'll just like maybe you'll just wait, or you'll just be like, I'm not going to get in that uh, turn and face him. Be like, come on, or maybe he just needs to do a bit of training, so he's moving a little bit quicker. Well, yeah, my friend was unsympathetic. He was like, well, he won't do that again, will he? <laughs> well, I'm thinking, well, yeah, but he was, uh, you know, literally, I don't know. He could not be at work today or yesterday. He could have been, he, he went down. He could be on a podcast, bad mouthing you, Gary, for this. Well, I have um, searched the local uh, Facebook Papers. groups <laughs> to see if oh, he's snagging me. <laughs> way too much into this. <laughs> so, yeah, if somebody knows him and he is, listen, I hope he's okay. Um, it wasn't what I planned that day on that run. Yeah, it ended, ended the run unpleasantly and probably ruined his uh, trip out oh, with his friend on his bike. It happens, it happens. And everyone listening will relate to having, ha having had rage on the trail yeah. or some sort of similar incident with yeah farmers or whatever. So yeah. we've all been there, Gary. Move on now. But that was that. That was that. So, yeah, you've been running, Eddie. I'm a bit surprised by this. Yeah, I've seen your... you should perhaps publicize that. Uh <laughs> Brins appalled at me. Um, uh, yeah, last week. So, yeah, last time we chatted was the epic three-day podcast recording fest. Um, lots of people asked, like, how we did, how I told that story. I did write the story, didn't I, first. That took a day to write it all out. I didn't actually then use it when I was talking, pretty much talked from memory, but that was a good way to, I wrote it out like a diary. I've hidden that sheet now on our script sheets, Gary, because I don't want to see it again. Has it gone? <laughs> <laughs> it's still there. I've just hidden it. Um, I'm actually writing a double page. I'm a double page spread. I'm a centerfold, Gary, for Runner's World in the next couple of months. Oh, awesome. I am writing my story then, but it's not quite, it's not the podcast story. Do they get a media team? Someone come out and take pictures of you in the Yeah, they've got, well, they've got, I think they've bought the photos from the Spine media team. Cool. Uh, but I'm trying to tell the story, but in a Runner's World format, so it's slightly more fluffy, yeah. slightly yeah. less deep. I've lost to count i've lost when i finish now am i like 10 days a week and a half yeah or am i two weeks two and a half weeks no no no. i think it is 10 days yeah roughly. yeah i think it's sooner than i think i think it's gone quickly and that's why i started running and brim was like what are you doing and i was like it's been two and a half weeks and he's like it's been like <laughs> nine days i'm like oh whoa eddie um yeah last week god it was rough gary uh, let's not sugarcoat this that actually last week was almost worse than the spine race itself i just felt so bad this is where having kids i mean i love them but they were just like get i picked them up from school and it's been freezing here and it, yeah. it just got in my 
bones. I just couldn't get warm. Like the school and be standing in the playground, minus like 20 in the shade. Like, oh my God, come on. Then they're like 15 minutes late and I've lost the will to live. <laughs> uh, and it'd be like six o'clock. And that's like the busiest time then from like six until half past eight when all the kids are back and it's homework and it's tea. And it's, and I was like, I cannot, I cannot cannot even get off the sofa i just like the kids loved it mum just like normally i'm super <laughs> productive at that time of day i'm just being like oh i can't i can't trying to catch up on all my work as well with like the brain that didn't function not oh well because all that would have been all that i mean i don't think i've ever taken that long off work yeah but many years, even when I had gave birth to Evie, Bryn brought my laptop into the hospital the day after and I <laughs> caught up on all my plans. So I, yeah, it was a lot to catch up on. And then some calls. I had quite a few clients doing the arc of patrician. Uh, I oh, wasn't, goodness me. You're on yeah, it straight it was, away. It was, it was back on it. And yeah. so, yeah, I really didn't feel good. I didn't feel good about myself. I tell you what did make me feel good about myself was all the podcast love that came out from when it went live. I was quite nervous about that. I said, sent you a message and I said, I'm not sure I told the story as well as I could because uh, so much to tell. Well, I had enough time, didn't I? God, if you can't do it in two and a half hours. Uh, anyway, so yeah, I did. Uh, anyway, weekend came and I did feel better. I went skiing on Saturday. Oh my God. So Goodness me, Eddie, you've been two, mega busy. I know. We had two kids skiing and one not skiing. He'd skied in the morning. So we went up in the afternoon and I said to him, I want to ski with mum, which isn't their favorite occupation because it's like the the uh, pace of uh, some sort of snail compared to them. Anyway, we were, it was really busy. And the first run we did, I, was, I like to think that nobody skis faster than me in the ski resort. Yeah. <laughs> I do not let people overtake me normally. <laughs> um, my friends call me Bridget Jones with, epic speed because Classic. sometimes there's uh I, go really <laughs> fast for that. I do normally ski quite fast and i can ski okay we can ski most things oh my gosh it was terrible i mean bryn was like waiting at the bottom looking back up the hill going what yeah i couldn't get my legs to turn everybody was like going fast. i was like what did you expect <laughs> i was like come on legs and then it was so busy there were so many people around so he had to keep doing like quick turns and i was like i can't get the brain and the legs to this is terrible and it was freezing cold as well like, oh, no we did two runs and Brim was like hot chocolate i was like yes yes chocolates we went and had a hot chocolate i had a crepe and then that helped and the legs got going and it did end up skiing there's a there's a sort of home run down which is quite challenging and uh i skied down that managed to keep up with uh, Finley, even though he was off piste and doing all the jumps and I was on piste and just going straight down, but <laughs> the legs did start working. And then I did a bit of cross country skiing on Sunday, uh, literally half an hour up and down, moved the legs a bit, moved the arms a bit, the wrists. So, oh yes, my wrists, I should update you on that. So, uh, my lovely friends that, um, that live out here, they paid for me to go and have some treatment on my wrists and on my feet, which was lovely. So I went to my, uh, lovely massage sports therapist lady, and she uh, basically stroked me, as I said, for an hour. <laughs> but she got right into my arms and released all everything. She didn't go near the tendons, but she went all around. She gave me some exercises to do. She yeah. gave me heaps of exercises to do. And I was just nodding, going, I'm not, I, look, <laughs> I'm struggling to like stay awake for a day. I'm really, the, anyway, it, well, the minute she did that, the next day, they'd been so much better. They still, yeah, cross country skiing was a step way too fast. Yeah, because all on the wrist again. Yeah, yeah, it's all on the wrist. That was a disaster. <laughs> But they are so much better and I don't, they're still stiff, but no pain now. So I'm really happy with that. Um, and yeah, I did try, because I've got the dogs guy. These are all my excuses. Here we go. I have to walk the dogs and it's freezing in the morning. It's so unpleasant to walk. So I was like, I might as well just jog. So I went for a jog yesterday and uh, of course. We need to rewind and listen to what you were saying at the, uh, I, know, our, our I, know, coach. I know, I know. I can't find my watch. Bryn's like, Bryn is just like mocking me because I came and he's like, that was way too long. I was like, well, I haven't got a watch on. So I'm just going out running. I don't know how long I'm going for. Anyway, I went for a little jog yesterday. Everything felt fine, though I did feel a bit incobubulated, my legs. And then I went again today and went, wait, I went too far. I went almost an hour. It was way too much and uh, was retired. And then my blisters started hurting. Oh, my God. Oh, and I got new blisters, I think. Anyway, so. We will backtrack a little bit, but it felt so good. It felt so good. I'm like an addict. It felt so good to be out and moving and fresh air and being normal. It's just my normal routine. Because I think last week I must have got a bit like low and a bit like, 
oh, I'm never going to be able to live life. I'm never even going to be able to go to CAF 4 again. I'm too tired. <laughs> so I've done a couple of I won't run. I won't run again for a couple of days. I did, though, I did say, swear to myself that for every minute I spent running, I have to spend the same amount of time rolling and stretching. And so I have done that. Oh, that's good admin. So, yeah, I like um, it. There is there is a little bit of method in my madness, and it will get. I've uh, I've retired from my swift racing team for the foreseeable future, Gary. Oh, I was back on the rotor for next week, and I just I was like, <laughs> can't. And the woman sent me an email saying, um, you know, you've not been on Swift for a month. You know, what's up? And I was like. <laughs> Oh, she didn't know you'd been. She didn't know. Pushing the so I, with. Yeah, I was like, well, I was like, fair enough. You know, she's like, obviously you're going to be rubbish, even more rubbish than normal. So I thought, you know what? I can't even blag this. I was reserved for next week. And I thought, I can't, I can't, that's not fair on the girls that are racing that I'm yeah. going to step up. My heart rate should not be going above a hundred beats for the next few weeks, definitely. So I did really enjoy it, but it's so late. That swift racing, that mental, do you remember how horrendous it was? And I used to be ruined the next day and it was so hard. I had to think about that during the spine. It did give me a little bit of an extra match when I needed it. And I thought about those Tuesday nights. It did help even physically, maybe not so much, but mentally it gave me a bit of strength. All those times that you got yourself uncomfortable, I think uh, think good little nuggets to take on board. So yeah, but so much better. I feel so much better, but this is going to be a long game. This is going to be a long recovery game. And you just need to keep reminding me of what I said the week before and that I must. uh... But I think what I need to do as well is just open up my, uh, do do get back on my bike so that I can get a little bit of, I feel better for moving. Everyone will understand that, don't they? That you feel better for moving. And at least if I'm on my bike, I'm in the warm and I can catch up on uh, YouTube videos and Netflix and stuff. So tomorrow I'll, jump back on my bike and just, just half an hour, just half an hour, just to get a fix. Get Motion is lotion. Gary. <laughs> it is. <laughs> I didn't make that up. I stole that from another podcast. Motion is lotion. Anyway, uh, let's go on. What are we doing? Brew with the coaches. It's good to have uh, Trish and Russell back for Brew with the Coaches this week. And we have a question from Robert Williams. And he asked, it's a super interesting question, actually, how to train when you have a hard a physical job. This week's brew with the coaches question comes from Robert Williams. Right, this is quite a long question, and I'm glad we've got three coaches here because I haven't got a clue how to answer this one. But Robert asks, what is their experience advice for those who are training but have hard physical jobs? Most info out there is based around get off your butt, less sedentary life uh, type assumptions. But for those of us who spend the day doing heavy work that doesn't apply. For example, I lift and climb ladders and pull hoses all day so find it really difficult to keep my weight down, mostly because I tend towards building muscle easily. He tries to train before work, but we have a one-year-old, so that is tricky. So at 5 or 6 a.m., but have to be careful to leave enough in the tank for work. He ran the Glen Ho Skyline last year, but DNF'd at the infamous Checkpoint 9. He was in great shape, but he just didn't have uh, the steep climbing speed. This year, he's trying to build more zone two sessions and slim down with the name of a Bob Graham round in September, but will be interested in what the coaches say and any experience they have training people with physical jobs, working less is an option, unfortunately, since apples cost £13 here the other day. Well, that is a big question. Do you think Robert is a fireman? I think so, yeah. <laughs> I've got a lovely picture of Robert while we talk about this. Yeah, Russell, how would you... Uh, you <laughs> yes. used to have a physical job, so yeah, if you could go first with this one. Okay. Hi, Rob. I uh, used to be a builder. I was building for three years. I feel like I've been waiting my whole life. Someone's asked this question because <laughs> I have so much experience from the difficulty of juggling manual labor and then running. They don't always marry up really well. And the weight, which you mentioned first, is a massive issue. And I did try for a while to keep to race weight while I was working as a builder and I just realized I couldn't do it. Race weight is like, you're pretty fragile and vulnerable and I felt the cold more, I'd get bumps and bruises, everything just would sting and hurt more. 
I also found that I was getting more colds. So I would normally eat a lot while I was um, building and laboring and I, and I not really weigh myself. And I was probably about half a stone, nearly a stone heavier. Weight does um, come into performance and there's just no way around that. If you, if you want to perform at a high level, then you are going to feel, you know, an extra half a stone or a stone or if, if you're in America, you might be, no, you would be in stone. So I would try and drop the weight um, a few weeks before a, a race. So if I had like a goal race, an A race, then two weeks before, hopefully I was, you know, shirking my work a little bit and taking um, annual leave. And so that I didn't have the same demands, but I would never go into caloric deficit while I was working because you just life's hard enough. You don't want to get injured or ill. So I'd always make sure I was eating loads to try and keep it healthy, lots of protein. But yeah, just a few weeks before I would cut out a few, uh, I was probably eating like five meals a day and I would just cut that back and I'd drop that weight. And then a few days before the race, obviously carbo loading and fill those glycogen stores back up. So that was the thing on the weight. Yeah, I wouldn't try to, to stay to race weight while you're while you're doing a physical job. With me, the way that I did it was periodization. So I'd really recommend that. And the athletes that I coach that are um, laboring, I could only really train like really hard while I was laboring that um, uh, intensely about half of my life. So I would have, I was running for marathons. I'd have a spring marathon and autumn marathon. And I would do like a three month block and I would get my family and my friends behind me and I'd let them all know, okay, these three months I'm going to be training hard. And I would put some red lines around it. I was thinking um, consistency, volume, intensity. So I had to be consistent every week, even on the tough weeks. I had to go out and get the runs done. But it was only 12 weeks and I had a two-week taper, so it was only really 10 weeks. So I was just hanging on, working hard and periodizing. So for those three months, I would be training really hard and there was no way around it. It was tough. The rest of the time I would have holidays and then just keep ticking over and then, you know, be a lot more of a balanced person. So yeah, the consistency. So that means like eating a lot, sleeping a lot and then volume. I was running like a minimum of 80 miles a week. And if I could, and if I was having easier a week at work, I could push that up to like a hundred. And I, and I think the most I ever managed was like 105. That was really tough. And something that helped me a lot was to read lots of marathoners in the UK in the 80s. They were working full-time um, physical jobs and they were running these kind of miles. So I would read their books. There was a guy in the 90s who's still a coach now. I'll get in touch with him. Just try and get any info you know, from these guys at how they were doing it. So yeah, it's just making sure you know what it takes before you start on a on a big build up like that if the race is really important to you it's no beer no netflix no friends your family hate you your builder mates hate you <laughs> you don't see your kids <clears throat> like yeah i i was speaking to my wife the other day i asked her to if she could keep the um dishes out of the sink and she said you left me in the sink for three years so i'm still paying <laughs> things back that you know that i um i cast it on Totally relate to that conversation. <laughs> oh God, yeah, she was like a single mum for those for those times when I was training hard. But you know, it was worth it for me. Maybe not for her, but that was the fittest I was ever in my life. You know, I was so strong as well as ha having the aerobic engine, and I just couldn't do that now. You don't get the same kind of strength, you know, being in the gym for an hour as you do just being out working yeah. eight ten hours a day. And the last thing I would say is um, the little lifts. Like if you're doing a lot of lifts, um, John Downs, a guy around 150 miles a week, and um, he was a 13 minute 5K runner, excellent runner, but also a builder. And he did his back in, and um, it was the little lifts, and he, and he was just not setting his back straight. So obviously, if it's a heavy lift, you set your back and you take it serious, but it's all those little ones like the toolbox, or if it's you and it's like, a, I don't know, a heavy ladder or whatever, just make sure you're setting your back because um yeah it's those ones that get your back but yeah it was worth it and uh and i would really recommend it and yeah i've got builder friends and they um they're running really well and it's just that prior um the hierarchy of priorities consistency is the number one thing just hustling the weeks when it's hard at work and then you know making hay when the sun shines volume and then intensity like if you can get 
um, some faster stuff done that's faster than race pace. I like the idea as well as you sort of alluded on it there is like having a really structured plan. There's no, and there's no like, even this sort of in Rob's lifestyle, it sounds like there's no, you, there's no give or take. This is when you do your training. I wonder if you can train to and from work as well, Robert, or you can train after work before you go home might be a really good idea as well. The other thing to look at is what your job is giving you as well. It's giving you so much strength and endurance. So you don't need to focus on that much as well. I find it funny that you struggled up the steeper climbs. Um, I think that's fuel related more than uh, fitness related. Um, so it might be worth looking at your fueling during your uh, racing as well, because I would have thought you would be flying up those steps. Yeah, up and down, up and down ladders all day. <laughs> strength that you've got. Uh, as always with clients, we always say like, just you've got to be able to do what you can do. Don't worry about what anyone else can do. And uh, and consistency is key. Like Russell said, just uh, day in, day out. I wouldn't worry as well as so you're doing a massive amount of volume at work is almost back off from any intensity and just focus on the running and the volume and doing something every day and let the body weight take care of itself and it, it's the weight that is meant to be to enable you to do your job and to run you've just got to get the right balance you sound like a great guy and you sound like you're really driven and i think writing a plan sticking it on the fridge and saying these are the three months i'm going to focus on this and this is the race i'm going to do is going to be the key let us know how you got on trish you got anything else to add to Farman Roberts. Oh, Farman Roberts. I, I mean, I would, I would just say in, in regards to completely agree in terms of periodizing. I mean, I used to be in the army and play lots of different sports as well as run. And the thing I found that worked well is for me is you've got to have sometimes quality over quantity is is better. So making sure you're having a, a set training plan in terms of knowing specifically what you're going to be doing in those sessions. So you know, if you're if you're struggling on the on the ascents, then maybe you know your specificity. You need to really kind of get out there and concentrate. If you can only do three runs runs a week, make sure one of those runs is on that kind of or once a month in your block or whatever. Getting out to that terrain and doing that kind of stuff. But um, when you're up against it and you're you're doing lots of different stuff, which sometimes can detract from running, you've got to have the set times. And get that quality over the over the quantity. I think that's more important when when it's hard work like like you've got at the moment. If weight is an issue, I don't know what Robert's diet is, how what the quality of his nutrition is. But yeah, if weight is an issue, I would definitely try and look at foods that were kind of nutrient dense as opposed to the burgers and chips which you crave. Um, because sometimes you know if you're having a big bowl of veggies, you just physically can't eat <laughs> that amount. While if you had a two snickers or something you probably got the calories from such oh, a massive oh, healthy yeah two snickers but yeah pretty much echo everything you guys said cheers rob <laughs> yeah thanks robert hope that helped thanks trish and russell always love our brother coaches i was definitely not on my a great game for the next few beer with the coaches because they were two days post five so my voice is like that i'm definitely lying down in bed recording <laughs> <laughs> well, i like to it. it's good to have three people uh yeah. it's opinion because I, I i was struggling with that one actually when it when i when i read that email so it was good to have their perspective this week we chat with dr siobhan brennan all about menopause and hormones this was requested on our facebook group actually and so uh we've taken a few questions from patreon as well a really interesting deep dive into uh, what happens to women's bodies as we approach menopause and as we go through menopause. I hope you enjoy our chat with Siobhan. Hi Siobhan, thanks so much for coming on the show. You are a GP uh, who runs with an interest in holistic health. Before we get into our conversation about menopause, could you share a bit about yourself and your background as a runner? Sure. Um, so I'm Siobhan. I'm a GP in a rural area in the Peak District. I've been a GP for about 14, 15 years. Um, I, I'm 52. I'm postmenopausal. Um, I had a surgically induced menopause when I was in my early 40s. So it's something that I, I've kind of had to learn about the hard way. 
Um, I first started running nine years ago after I adopted my two little boys and I just needed some headspace for myself. And um, running very quickly became kind of uh, just a passion of mine. And I've jumped up in terms of distances because I'm more slow and steady back of the pack kind of girl from doing a half marathon to then jumping to do lakes in a day, which was a 50 miler. And then I've kind of progressed from there. And I see quite a lot of patients who are similar age to me, but I'm also a member of um, Marple Runners, which is where I work. Um, and I try and raise quite a lot of awareness whenever I see uh, particularly female athletes about um, their hormones and particularly about the menopause. And I tend to gravitate. Lots of my friends are similar age and background to me. And kind of I, I aim to empower people and, and give tools to be able to kind of find their way through kind of a very which is a difficult a very difficult journey which the menopause is and what is you know i'm a middle-aged man i don't really know much about the menopause uh so yeah what is it so for women um once we start to leave our childbearing years behind us um usually from the age of 45 to, to about 51 maybe 55 women's estrogen levels decline and, and also other levels called progesterone decline. And what that means is estrogen is something that if it allows us to produce eggs to, 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 fertilize, to, to, to be fertilized, to create babies, because um, it, it's a very generic um It's a very generic hormone that actually when it starts to deplete, we often, as women, just have very subtle symptoms that are not necessarily all about kind of getting a regular period and having regular periods. So for lots of women, um, it, from their mid-30s onwards, they can sometimes notice just very subtle changes in how they feel, and that impacts hugely on, on training potential. And as our estrogen levels decline, our other hormone levels like progesterone and women's testosterone levels start to decline too. And it it's a progressive decline. So it's very different to male hormone decline. Men do suffer from a slight decrease in testosterone as they get older, yeah. but it reach a baseline, whereas for women, they crash from having quite high hormone levels, particularly of estrogen and progesterone, and that it, the dip and the crash that very often can happen quite subtly from the age of about 35 onwards um, can have quite a catastrophic impact on their day-to-day -day lives, their running performance, um, and their mental health. Is there like an end point, then is there a point in their life when they probably will be uh, past men? Pause. Traditionally, it's always been thought that, taught that women aged between the age of 45 and 55 are approaching the menopause. And the menopause is when is defined as a year without periods when your hormone levels are at their lowest. Okay. But recent studies have shown that actually quite a lot of women go into what's called a perimenopause. So it's that gradual decline where they're often still having periods, but they're all over the place. Yeah. And start any time from the age of 35 up until a proper menopause with no periods. Um, but that can also be delayed until the age of 57, 58. So each woman has their own individual journey that is unique to them. Um, I think the take home message I would give to most women is be aware of your hormones, be aware that they they will vary and that that can start from any age. Don't necessarily assume that you're too young to be in the perimenopause or the menopause. You mentioned uh, that it does have an effect on performance, training. Yeah, some of the classic symptoms. Oestrogen depletion particularly is, is one that causes such a, a huge remit of symptoms. People talk a lot about hot flashes or hot flushes where women will just suddenly become incredibly red, incredibly hot and start sweating profusely. Um, that can happen in the daytime as well as at nighttime. Um, sleep disturbance is a very classic one, whether you wake with hot flushes or not. Low mood, irritability, anxiety. And lots of women will notice that actually they're becoming more anxious, but they cannot pin down kind of what's triggering that. And for lots of women, is the menopause. 
menopausal women with a decrease in estrogen tend to store fat differently. So we will often have to train harder than when we were younger because we develop something called insulin resistance. So we store fat in our middles and our changes. So doing the training and eating the way that we did when we were younger doesn't tend to work as well. Um, it can impact on gut. It can uh, trigger irritable bowel symptoms. And joint stiffness is one that I particularly notice in lots of really fit athletes. They're getting out of bed in the morning and they're creaking around the place and feeling just very stiff and very demotivated. And that's that's why it's so important to kind of talk around all of kind of the knowledge around menopause, at least the awareness around that. I think that is one of the biggest things we ch- we had a quick chat before, didn't we, Siobhan, about this podcast is that it's a massive area to cover, but hopefully if you're listening to, to this, perhaps you might recognize a few of these symptoms, but that often knowledge is power as well. And if you know why you're getting these symptoms, um, you instantly always, ever, as ever, if you feel ill, or you have an injury, once you know what it is, you feel a little bit better that you're not just being a bit loopy and a bit crazy and you've suddenly changed. If you know why this is and there's a reason, um, and then perhaps you can look at how you can help treating some of these symptoms. But I think one of the biggest thing is just knowing that you're not alone and that this does happen to lots of people. And as runners as well, you probably hear, hear this and recognize this, Siobhan, is that we are super aware of our bodies and every little change and every little feeling, both men and women, we're quick to like be like, that's different, that's different, something's different, something feels mm-hmm. different. And so we are probably uh, hyper aware as we move into perimenopause and then menopause as well, um, that of these different changes, we feel them probably a little bit more than perhaps uh, women who aren't so in touch with some of the the physical feelings that we feel generally every day on a run. Mm -hmm. I would say one of the best, if you are perhaps not quite approaching menopause or perimenopause as athletes, as female athletes as well, is to track your cycle. There's lots of apps that you can track your cycle or on your training plan. And so you can just keep an eye on your cycle, whether it's regular, whatever regular means to you as well. And then if any of these little symptoms creep in, perhaps you might be able to as well just to start uh, to pinpoint some changes as well. We've got some questions from, quite a few questions from Patreon, which I'd like to jump into. And I thought a st- start with uh you mentioned about sleep disruption um mm-hmm. and claire howard has asked she says uh as an athlete gold star recovery and ability to get fitter is to be able to, to have a good night's sleep and uh sadly then as we get, we approach menopause our sleep can be really disturbed that might be due to temperature changes it might be due to um the change in the hormones, which can then cause anxiety, wake up, oh gosh. You say a gold star of recovery, but if you can't sleep, then that in itself will trigger the anxiety. It's so frustrating. Any tips for women that might come in and say, it's the sleep, the sleep is killing me. When I consult with somebody about if they're, whatever symptoms they're presenting with, the first thing I get them to do is to download the Balance app, which okay. is one of the by a GP called Louise Newson. The Balance app allows you to track your cycle, but it allows you to track your sleep. It allows you to track any symptoms so that you can quantify the huge impact that it potentially may be having on your life. And sleep is, uh, poor sleep is often attributed to anxiety. But for a lot of menopausal ladies, it's because their estrogen levels have dipped down, but their progesterone levels have dipped down and progesterone helps sleep. And while I'm not kind of saying, you know, drugs are good, go for HRT all the time. That fact is very, very relevant and and the impact of HRT on sleep can be an absolute goal changer for quite a lot of athletes. Um, Sleep hygiene is incredibly important and the way that we live nowadays is very different. You know, we have have phones, we're contactable, there's no quiet time for the brain and what I would normally say to somebody like that who's experiencing real difficulties with sleep, actually what 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 aspects of sleep are bothering you are you struggling to drop off to sleep are you waking are you waking anxious are you waking because you have hot sweats and i kind of the, the main areas that i tend to focus on is 
proper sleep hygiene, withdrawing from any tech whatsoever. Sometimes having a bath can help with that temperature regulation that is so difficult in the menopause. Look at meditation. and There's loads of really good apps out there to basically try and dissociate from everything in your day that makes going to sleep difficult. Because once you have that insight that your sleep is difficult, it can become a self-perpetuating cycle. There are lots of other therapies out there that are really useful for sleep as well, and ones that I take myself. Um, I take magnesium at night time. Um, I use an accredited brand, which I have several of them here. So I only, if I'm going to use supplements, and there's a very good evidence base for them, particularly with sleep, I always go for something that is accredited. So I use Viridian Nutrition Capsules because I've, I've, I've kind of seen their data. I've been invited and seen kind of talks about kind of the huge remit out there that, that can help us to live better. And magnesium has a good magnesium uh, 3 and 8 and magnesium glyconate have a good evidence base for helping people to drift off to sleep and maintain sleep at night time. And then lots of practical strategies strategies look at make sure that your your sheets are cotton 100% cotton that there's no kind of polyester mix there so that you can actually wick away any sweat yeah Have in the room if that's useful but but to be quite honest i think actually maintaining a lower temperature in your room is much much better long term making sure that your room is really dark to help promote that positive sleep um and and i've also kind of found kind of other strategies that are unique to athletes like looking at the aspects of um nasal breathing um which taps into meditation taps into better ways of breathing efficiently at night time and a lot of this has a decent evidence base and it's about unpicking kind of and using all of those strategies that are useful but for a lot of women it comes down to actually they need HRT. They need both the estrogen arm, but they need the progesterone, which predominantly people take at night time. And that is really useful in terms of helping sleep as well as giving you the HRT benefits. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Let's dive in a little bit more into the HRT. Kim Cavill asks, and, and this is something that's cropped up a lot with quite a few of my coaching clients as well, is how best to approach uh, your GP if you are suffering from symptoms um, and how to ask for HRT and your thoughts on HRT. I think uh, I've had quite a few clients that have gone to doctors and have been turned away um, and had to, had to go and get second opinions. What's your sort of, what, what's the best way to approach your GP? Let's answer that one first. Um, I think knowledge, knowledge is empowerment and sensible knowledge that's evidence-based is really important. So what I tend to signpost my patients to do when I do workshops about what to think about and how to approach your GP, download the Balance app, start logging your symptoms proactively because it will help kind of you to understand a little bit more the impact of the menopause on yourself, um, but also it will help a GP understand that this is more about menopause rather than just putting it down to being anxious or being overwhelmed with life. Traditionally, you know, doctors were never really taught about the menopause. Um, and I can remember even when I was a patient myself and, and had radical surgery, there was no offer from a gynecologist of HRT, and that's going back about 12, 13 years ago. But there's been a huge kind of amount of, of awareness raised and lots of really proactive GPs out there that are empowering themselves with knowledge, that are doing courses. And there is nothing better for me as a GP than speaking to somebody who has downloaded the app or they've looked at some of these, which is like a menopause hit list um, that was done by uh, Viridian Nutrition, which again, it just allows patients to quantify the impact on their lives and for them to basically kind of understand a little bit more so that when you go into a consultation with the GP, you, you have kind of this diarized kind of symptom log, which can help a GP to understand the impact on your life. Also having that, that kind of that knowledge about the role of of nutrition and diet and everything else that is out there holistically that can help you is really useful because what you want really, if you feel that HRT is 
lack is is a fit for you then when you go to see your gp having that knowledge around what options are out there what's safe for me in my personal circumstances what do i want to get out of this is it makes the consultation so much easier GPs only get 10 minutes with a patient, which is no time. And I always overrun with menopause consultations. And what I always do is I give patients the knowledge to go away and look at the options that are out there. Um, and, you know, if if you come away from a consultation with a GP and, and you feel that your questions haven't been adequately answered, well, it's not unreasonable to go back and, you know, not, not be confrontational, but just go back and kind of say, well, have should we be thinking about HRT um, or go and see somebody else? Um, it's, it's the knowledge is improving. Um, and I think certainly the knowledge out there for patients is there. And it's so much better to basically do your research, but look at accredited research. And that's why I signpost women to the Balance app or Menopause Matters, because it's sensible information that will give them as much information that they need to be able to make a well-reasoned judgment on what they feel would best fit for them. It makes me sad that we have to do this as women, that we have to actually go in with this knowledge bank and with this diary to in, in order to get something to help us feel better, which we shouldn't need to do. But I can totally get why you do need to do this. But again, I, I feel slightly like if it was a man's problem with, the, with this HRT be available at your local the grocery store. Hey, I get that, but I think there's such there's such um, there's such an amount to understand around the menopause and its effect on on us as women that. Speaking as a GP, I I love it when when women have done the research, have really totally understood kind of the whole impact of kind of the menopause because it it shouldn't be defining, but very often it is. And for, if somebody comes to me having done all of that research, then it's a case of bish, bash, bong. We know where we want to be. We know what's suitable for you. And it gives for kind of a more timely intervention. I think, and I totally acknowledge your point that historically women, you know, have gone to GPs and been told they felt anxious um, or, you know, the menopause was simply a phenomenon of, well, just get on with it, love. Um, and that was very much my own personal personal experience at a very early stage from a gynecologist. But times have changed and I think it's it's something that is a huge thing to talk about. So very often having done your research, not using Dr. Google, but using the Balance app, using Menopause Matters, looking at kind of the Viridian Health Toolkit, they're they're really useful and it is very much about empowering yourself as a woman because it's not just about HRT, it's about diet, it's about what you eat, it's about when you eat, about how you live, not just kind of looking at the medical management, if that makes sense. Totally. I'd like to jump a little bit into nutrition, but first let's just just tell perhaps perhaps people won't actually know what we're talking about when we're talking about HRT. Can you just give us a quick, like, what exactly is it and what does it do to help us with the symptoms? Okay, so um, HRT is a preparation that repletes estrogen. Um, but and So there's two arms to HRT traditionally. You have the estrogen arm, which will replete decreasing estrogen levels. And, and women will often see an improvement in sleep, um, in hot flushes, in skin elasticity, energy levels. But then there's also the progesterone arm and the progesterone arm of HRT. Progesterone is a hormone that we always would tend to give to women that still have their womb because one of the side effects of estrogen is it can thicken the lining of the womb and that can be a cause for concern. Um, and what we want to do is give somebody enough estrogen to make them feel better in a safe way. So women would always be given estrogen with progesterone. Progesterone has lots of benefits as well as protecting the womb from overgrowing extra cells from estrogen. It can really help with sleep. It can help with uh, tendon elasticity. Um, and um, it is something that you would take for say two weeks of the month while you're actively having periods. But if you're more than a year after your periods having stopped, you'd be taking it continuously. 
And HRT is available in lots of different preparations. There have been huge supply issues around HRT over the past couple of years. Um, I've had my own thoughts on that because we've not really had any shortage of Viagra to date or um, testosterone. Um, but um, the I think some of that is, is centred on increased prescribing because of increased education and knowledge amongst doctors. Um, and the drug companies are responding to that by increasing production. Um, the gold standard of HRT for me is always topical. So topical gel, estrogen gel with either an oral tablet or a vaginal tablet. And that gives you your estrogen arm and your progesterone arm. So you're getting kind of the best of both worlds. You can do that in a patch. Sorry, that was my cat sneezing. Uh, <laughs> you can have a topical patch and some women really like patches because you slap it on twice yeah, a week. Sounds um, like and thing. Get it done. Don't need to think about it anymore. Don't need to think about it. You can set up an app that reminds you to do it every four days. And for a lot of women, they really like that, but you can get problems with them sticking. They can cause a bit of local irritation and sometimes they can come off. I've heard, heard stories of like one of my patients, her patch came off and ended up stuck to her husband's arm and he was absolutely terrified that he, he would... started to put lipstick on and <laughs> jewelry. Um, yeah. And then there, the third option would be oral tablets. And, and we tend to go down that route less and less because with the oral tablets, you have increased risk factors associated with them of um, the, 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 the small increase in breast cancer is increased with oral preparations. Um, and for patients that suffer from, say, migraines or have inherited um, familial clotting problems, <clears throat> they would be precluded from taking an oral tablet. But the actual the gel or spray, estrogen, is actually much, much, much safer to use. And it's easy to tweak it up and down, depending on how patients are doing with it. Um, so there's lots of different preparations available. And probably my ideal scenario would be for a woman who's either actively having periods or not would be to have a, a marina coil which gives you your progesterone arm to protect your womb and then topical estrogen and that is the that's kind of my gold standard and a marina coil can very often have the impact of regulating periods and making them lighter as well as giving you your HRT for five years. So all you have to do once your marina coil is in, slap on a bit of estrogen gel every day. Very straightforward. Taking hormones uh, as an athlete, there's a little warning bell. Do you need to have anything from your doctor as obviously, I mean, not, not many of us are going to be in the position to be drugs tested at an event. Or, uh, do you need a chewy for this? Uh, uh yeah, you don't generally. I think sometimes it gets a little bit more blurry if patients are also prescribed testosterone in addition to additional okay. HRT. Now, the prescribing of testosterone is, is a bit of a minefield in that um, GPs in some areas are allowed to prescribe, but in other areas they're not allowed by the, the governing bodies and the prescribing bodies. Um, when it is prescribable, um, it's usually under guidance from a, a, a consultant in hormones, um, but it's very carefully regulated. So patients would have a blood test before they would start it and a blood test a couple of months into using it. And it's only really licensed for libido, but it can give you a bit more, kind of get up and go a bit more energy, but it's only really licensed for libido. And you would never expect um, a patient to be on doses that would then kind of incur them queries from a, a certainly doping at events um, because quite carefully monitored. Yeah. So it's very different to any other type of medicine, really. I know about the coil from a contraceptive, contraceptive point of view. Is the coil that you mentioned earlier the same or is it or, or is it different it's the same marina coil so it's the hormone coil there are two general coils available for female patients one has hormones one doesn't okay. and what they do is they make the womb hostile to sperm for want of a better word yeah. 
The marina coil, so the hormone-based coil, is the one that we would always use as the, the second arm of HRT because it's releasing that hormone that will protect the womb from kind of over-thickening with being on HRT. And that can stay in for up to five years. So from a convenience point of view, yeah. it's absolutely huge. Sorry to go back. Sorry. No problem. Do you, uh, Gary, do you want me to ask a question about nutrition now or do you want to jump in with a question? So I don't... Well, no, the, I think the nutrition's good. You know, you mentioned about the supplements, the magnesium. Um, and uh, yeah, sorry if I'm getting the question wrong, Eddie. Are there any tips from a, a nutrition point of view that would help with, with, with the menopause? I think certainly what become, makes life a lot more difficult for women is we develop insulin resistance. So we store fat more easily and more readily. So when I'm talking to women about kind of the menopause, um, I, I have a huge focus on on what they're eating. Um, exercise in itself is not enough. And certainly we, we exist in a world where there's an awful lot of refined products out there, lots of hidden sugars. And from my perspective, I get patients to keep food diaries to look at what they're eating. Um, because very often we'll eat lots of carbs because we're training, we're training, we need carbs to fuel ourselves. And quite a lot of them are very refined and have lots of nasty sugars in them. And, and that kind of way of living and eating is very pro-inflammatory. Um, it yeah, doesn't... If you're in your 20s, you can get away with all that, can't you? you? You can, um, and uh, but that doesn't apply. Once you kind of start to hit your forties, you find that you have to, you really, really have to eat in a different way. Look at everything, examine everything that you're taking in, and very often keeping a food diary will really bring home. Yeah kind of what you're eating. So I encourage people to to eat lots of grains, anything that um, will be, if they're having kind of a breakfast, I don't want them to have a glass of sugary orange juice. I'd rather they have, you know, some good quality natural yogurt, some fermented yogurt of the kefir if they can, um, some fruits, not a huge amount of them because you only need a certain amount of sugar, but lots of grains, lots of flax seeds, lots of chia seeds, um, lots of greens. We really, really, really need to eat lots of really dark colored vegetables in in our diet kind of particularly in our menopausal phase we need lots of protein because when we're training we need protein and we need to eat a little bit before we train and we need to eat afterwards but we need to eat sensibly and not reach for the refined sugars so it will require thought it will require thinking about what you're taking in um, but it's such an easy win and it doesn't need to be expensive um, that's one of the key things it's very very achievable you can go to any of the cheaper supermarkets and buy bags of flax <clears throat> seeds and just really think about what you're taking in and be organized unfortunately it is about getting yourself organized and taking some ownership of what you eat and when you eat as well um, that kind of adage of you know eating eating three meals a day sometimes has to go out the win window for us as athletes because we'll often train at the end of a 13 hour working day as I will do. So I need to more graze, but I'll, I'll actually chomp on some, on, on some seeds and grains and nuts with a bit of yogurt or I'll have a banana and then I'll go out and run, but I'll make sure that I have my evening meal ready and it's going to be more kind of whole grain based. If it's going to have any carbs, it'll be the complex carbs, the slow release energy carbs and avoiding kind of all of that empty processed stuff. But it does require being organized, unfortunately, but it's an investment and you will only train as efficiently as the fuel that you put into your body. Yeah. And urge lots of, I'm not very keen on protein powders. I think there's plenty of protein, both animal and plant-based out there that is very easy to kind of, you know, to source. A lot of the plant pro, a lot of the, the, the kind of the more sports kind of marketed protein powders can have a lot of, of sugars in them that can really kind of trigger IBS. It can trigger sugar spikes. And as women already struggling to manage your glucose curves. Um, so I, personally, I, I don't partake in them, but I love food and I spend a lot of time organizing my food and I spend a lot of time eating food. As you approach menopause, there is that increased need for protein um, and you haven't can't reach for a juicy steak. Is there, have you got any tips for, for women perhaps who are vegetarians 
um, that, that they can up their protein without... Um, there are so, you know, you don't necessarily need to be meat based at all to get decent protein on board. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of grains, pulses. So I eat an awful lot of lentils, beans, and I, I buy the dried packets and just, just kind of soak them up into salads. So you don't, you don't need meat to, to actually get adequate amount. <laughs> protein um i think it is it traditionally has been more of a challenge um for vegan athletes to be able to to source adequate sources of replenishment but i think the the variety that's out there in terms of the, the variety of pulses and grains that we can buy and vegetables is so much better um, than it was even 5 years ago so there really there's no excuse and and certainly there are a lot of plant based meat kind of no chicken chicken but actually i'd prefer to eat more organically than that and actually have a big plate of of salad with lots of lots of kind of really vibrant colored foods and beans and grains rather than eat something that is manufactured so from my perspective you you know it's very achievable you just have to do it and that's hard because you're challenging yourself particularly as a female when you're in the menopause when you feel like rubbish when motivation is really low but actually it's the cornerstone of starting to take control of your health and feel better but i'm in a bit of a protein shake journey myself actually trying to research um and yeah you're right some of them uh you look at the back of the packet and you think my goodness me i don't want to be drinking all this but i have found a couple uh um, that seem to be uh, plant-based, which is good. Um, and also like the sweeteners they put into them. I think it's a stevia, which is a more of a natural uh, form of sweetener as opposed to your, your uh, is it, oh, could it be, aspartame, um, which seems qu quite a nasty sweetener. So yeah, I totally get what you're saying. I'd love to get all my protein from my diet, but sometimes, yeah, I just, I was trying to do the maths and I wasn't getting enough, but I can say, I've, I definitely, I'm not going to say who they are, the brands. I don't want to make this an advert, but I found definitely two. You just have to really examine what's in them and do the research. And as you say, aspartame and a lot of these artificial sweeteners are just, they stimulate more hunger than anything yeah. else. But I think, you know, they, everything has a role, but as long as you research it and you take ownership of it and you look at what's on the ingredient list and read around that. Um, and our needs will increase and decrease with training load as well. If, you know, because you do a lot of miles, Gary, so you're going to need more protein than probably the likes of me where I'm sporadic with my miles around kind of the various jobs that I do. But I know certainly as soon as my training load goes up, I have increased need for protein and I metabolize it quickly. And very often it will be around reaching for what is the most achievable in that day. Yeah. So it's that balance really, isn't it? Is there a benefit with having, uh, again, a lot of athletes trying to maybe manage their weight, they might go for the low fat option. Would there be a benefit in going for your full fat yogurt as opposed to your reduced fat? I prefer full fat. And, and certainly as, as a menopausal woman, there is evidence to suggest that you feel more full after a meal. So you get that satiety after, if you eat something that is full fat. But also for women particularly, I would encourage full fat because our bone density decreases as we get older. Our muscle mass decreases also. But particularly for our bones and our bone health, I would encourage women to have full fat um, natural yogurts. Yeah. I'm not a fan of full fat milk because I'm, I'm personally a skimmed milk person and that's that's a taste thing. Um, and I don't tend to really uh, advise more than beyond that, but I don't think we should be scared of our fats. I think there's been trends in, on social media around you know, having a low fat diet, uh, you know, as perimenopausal women should be the way forward. But actually, you know, the evidence nowadays is suggesting that women do need a little bit of fat and we do need that. Um, we do need the calcium from kind of what we take in, in dairy or other options. And I think certainly it's about being open to challenging ourselves and reading around kind of the evidence. There's lots of stuff published, very, you know, easy reading that is, there's not great evidence base behind it. And there's lots of really good speakers out there that talk about health and nutrition, like Tim Spector. Um, he's written some excellent books around, you know, how we eat 
you know, talking about the word diet, um, which is a very emotive word. And he unpicks quite a lot of the fallacies around food. So if people are looking for interesting podcasts around the myths around nutrition and diet, um, Tim Spector is a, he's a, an epidemiologist, but he has a huge, he set up the Zoe app and he set up the COVID app. And he's got some really useful, interesting resources that will often challenge people's perceptions of what they think is good eating or not but it's all evidence-based and that's kind of the, the real kind of crux of it going with something that is a good evidence base yeah 100%. yeah not just someone something someone has not an influencer on. based <laughs> yeah. um i love all your tone of this podcast Vaughan. i'm nodding my head a lot because uh uh it's all ringing true shall we go into a few more of people's questions now because we sort of to actually all these questions we've sort of touched on them so it would be good to sort of just um just go into a little bit more detail um should we start with rebecca rebecca morn has asked how to deal with consistently inconsistent training due to a variety of symptoms while keeping focus and drive and not spitting your dummy out we've sort of touched a little bit on this haven't we that that due to like probably a lack of sleep maybe changes in appetite maybe changes in mood it's very hard to uh to maintain focus on a on a training plan um I would say from a coach's point of view, you need a plan. This is when you need a plan and um, which you need perhaps somebody to help you stick with it. But I would also say taking a bit of Siobhan's advice and using the app and educating yourself on these symptoms might help you to realize that they are, they're just symptoms. They, they're not actually, um, they're not actually something that you're going to, you, you're suffering from them, but you can, by looking at nutrition, by looking at the sleep that you've said, Siobhan, you can perhaps help them and just uh, educate yourself a little bit more on what's happening rather than just getting the rage. I guess you see quite a lot of people coming into your surgery, Siobhan, that they are, they're angry that their bodies have suddenly changed and that they're having yeah. to go listening to all this. I'm like, this is, it, it does, it's, you know, it's work that well, women perhaps don't need at this time of their life. And it's, it's often at a time when you feel most overwhelmed because yeah. of the pause. So I think I would add to that in saying, you know, take take the pressure off yourself. Allow yourself to be accountable to somebody like a coach or a plan, but it has to be realistic and it has to be achievable. And don't say no, don't cut yourself off from the options of HRT, unpicking your diet, get books like this, which is my gold standard. Um, this is the second book that this lady, Stacey Sims, has written. And she is a sports physiologist in the US. She's got really good podcasts. This is my Bible. And I tell everybody I know to buy it. They're sick to death of hearing me talk about it. But <laughs> Her stuff is incredibly evidence-based, but it's practical and achievable. And that's what we want. We have busy lives. Our lives are really complex now compared to our mothers and our grandparents, our grandmothers. And the menopause wasn't talked about way back then because women didn't live long enough, you know, in a, in a lot of countries. And it wasn't that was spoken about. And I think my kind of, when you feel so overwhelmed, think, could I be perimenopausal? Am I menopausal? I need to talk to somebody about this. I need to quantify this so that I feel more empowered and less overwhelmed. Because the one thing that I really try and drive home to people is that you don't need to be defined by the menopause. The menopause should not be kind of the, the kind of, well, you're menopausal. So draw a line under trying to achieve anything. And we know in endurance events, particularly long distance ultra running, menopausal women can bring a huge amount to the table in terms of their athletic performance. And because of our inherent endocrine base as women, we have endurance, we have it. And it's just about trying to maintain it. And when we see signs that we're losing it, start doing a log, start taking some control, start taking some ownership of it. I love that. I love that taking control. And it's not the yeah. end. And it's it, it's just so unfortunate. It comes at that time of life when often kids have left, kids are grown up, they don't need you as much. You can go back and start looking, you start thinking about things that you want to do and suddenly the body starts not playing ball. But I think, as you said, it's, it's, it's a change. It's not the end. It's just a change and it's working out how to deal with that change. Rebecca, you're not alone. Talk to talk to friends, talk to your GP, download that balance app and um and keep moving forward. 
keep moving so, forward. Yeah, some great resources there. We've got another question from Ruth Kelly. And again, it's probably been touched on. Uh, bone cushion fatigue and joint pain really does inhibit my training. Any pointers on how other menopausal women seem to be able to smash it it's often a reflection of, of low estrogen so for a lot of women will come to see me with just bone crushing fatigue joint stiffness and joint pain and the first thing that i say to them is you know do you understand that your your muscle density is decreasing as time goes on or bone density is decreasing the elasticity of our tendons is de is, is is impacted so i would always say take over the counter vitamin d every day because most of us are depleted in that look at different ways of exercising so for me i do pilates and it, it's a it's an absolute game changer godsend isn't it oh I Gain muscle mass and, and basically gain some core strength, but it helps with fatigue. Graded exercise helps with fatigue and you don't need to be going out and running junk miles. Things like Pilates, swimming, but also stepping back and actually minding your emotional well-being as well. Meditate for 20 minutes, step back from everything. At the end of the day, for a lot of women that present with that awful intransigent fatigue and joint aches and pains, they need estrogen. And it's amazing the difference that it can make. I've, I've seen it in so many of my patients who, you know, their main symptoms are all brain fog, tiredness, fatigue, that reactivity, that stiffness. When they get out of bed in the morning, everything. <laughs> I, I have to had that for years. <laughs> but, it, you know, well, you have an excuse. You've just done the spot. Fairness. <laughs> but we normalize that and traditionally women have just said oh well this is part of getting older but that doesn't need to define you and it doesn't need to define your future and even if hrt isn't an option just think outside the box take your vitamin d look at other supplements that can help like ashwagandha is is another supplement that i take in terms of trying to balance kind of fatigue tiredness um, mood and I find it, it I do get benefit from that and there is a decent evidence base around that too it's not for everybody but it just helps my armor in terms of facing the day forward and HRT can be one element of that but it's all about kind of grading your exercise as well to make it achievable and that's where the big wins tend to be particularly with Pilates with weightlifting swimming um, to, to name just a few yeah, it doesn't need to be all about when we were in our 20s, it could all be about running and running and running and you could go out mm -hmm. and run a bath and the next day uh, sort of jump out of bed and go and play in a hockey <clears> match and then the next day. We just, I think being a little bit more mindful, Pilates and yoga is absolutely, if you've not, not got into it and, and maybe a little bit sceptical because you sort of see either women in leotards doing yoga or sort of uh, hippies doing Pilates and yoga, have a go. There's loads of so much out on YouTube if you're a, bit, a little bit nervous about getting involved in a class. But uh, it can be really helpful to move the body and move the spine in a different way and to get you connected with your body. If your body's moving perhaps a little bit differently as well, it's to get connected with your core and your breathing and just slowing down not all the exercise has to be about go 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 as well also not when we were younger we probably could exercise first thing in the morning and if you have the liberty and the grace spell to exercise at a different day as we get old a different time of day as we get older sometimes actually warming up the spine and doing a little bit of perhaps pilates or yoga or mobility first thing in the morning and then perhaps exercising one in the sunlight so you get a little bit of vitamin d but a little bit later when you've been able to get some fuel on board some protein on board as well and that can make all the difference um in your training as well so Good luck, Ruth. And if you haven't been to see your GP yet, do do go and see book in with Siobhan. Everyone's going to be moved finding out Siobhan's catchment area. <laughs> <laughs> That nice moved nicely on to Jessica Friend's yeah. question, actually. She's, she uh, wants some advice on strength and conditions. So I imagine there's a, a crossover between the two answers. But uh, yeah, any specific exercises that you might do, frequency and maybe duration of uh, sessions? Let's um, point Jessica straight to... Stacey, Stacey Sims again. I've got her first book here, and Vaughn's holding up her second book. We've got Raw and Next Level. She, she's done. She's done excellent chapters on strength and conditioning, and she gives you photographs and exercises on what to do. Um, Siobhan, do you want to touch on why it's so important uh, hormonally and as a, the menopausal body to do strength and conditioning as we get older? 
Absolutely. Um, our propensity to um, gain weight increases as we get older. Um, and unfortunately, that coincides with decrease in bone density. And the younger you are, that you approach, uh, when you approach the menopause, the more at risk of decreased bone density and fractures if you fall over. Um, couple that with um, kind of our, our muscle mass declines as we get older and we see that in our parents' generation, they they very often will walk with, with less carriage that we would have. They would have difficulty in standing on one leg. They have very poor coordination. Um, so the three kernels really are around our decreased bone density or decreased muscle mass. And then our tendons become more and more inflexible as well because of changes in our hormonal levels and it increases our risk of fractures it increases our risk of falls and it increases our risk of gaining weight um so from from my perspective you know it, it, it's so important there's no point in living longer if we're not going to live well and if we're going to have be at an increased risk of falling and getting injuries that will keep us away from doing the things that we really love so it's really, really important that women think around their bone density and their bone mass. And doing weights, lifting weights, is probably the best thing that you can do to preserve your muscle mass. It gives you a fantastic high. It's really hard. It will make you sweat a lot. And as a menopausal woman, you will need to make sure that you are hydrating religiously when you're exercising. But Pilates, weightlifting is kind of the magic combination in terms of maintaining yourself into older life and to minimize the risk of osteoporosis and falls that come with their own morbidity. And you don't need to, if you're thinking, oh my goodness, weightlifting, I've never been in a gym that's for men with big muscles. Don't be, don't overthink it. Okay. It doesn't need to be very complicated. It can be very simple movements. If, if you go to a gym, you can ask for a personal training session. You don't need to sign up, you know, for a huge block of personal training, but you could ask for a personal trainer to help you sh show you what, uh, how to use machines or how to use the exercises, very simple exercises that you need to to use it. And again, it doesn't need to be complicated, just like nutrition. It doesn't need to be everything. You want to look at big muscle groups. So you've got looking at squats, you're looking at lunges, you're looking at deadlifts, you're looking at any sort of pulls you can do with your arms, assisted pull ups, push, pull, pivot. Push, push, pull, pivot, basically. You can keep it super, super easy. And if you are a bit nervous about what to do, ask for a bit of advice in the, in the gym and then just Keep it really simple. Doesn't need to be super heavy weights either. Um, and perhaps it's a future podcast we should we could go into. Now Gary started his gym journey as well. well I just say anyone who's intimidated by the gym, I can. I haven't been to the gym. It must be a decade, and I just joined before Christmas. And it's wonderful. I love it. And like Siobhan says, there's an amazing power about being able to lift a heavy weight, especially as a yep. woman. I feel empowered when I go under that bar or I push or I pull something or a guy gets off a machine and I put the pin in heavier and I'm like, <laughs> it doesn't need to be gym based though as well. There is lots of things that you can do at home. Um, you can get kettlebells, get your postman to deliver a 10 kilogram kettlebell off Amazon. <laughs> you know, it doesn't need to be, you don't need to sign up for a gym membership. And there, again, there's heaps of stuff on you YouTube that you can uh, oh just send me a message pop into slip into my dms yeah. i love people slipping into my dms a lot of gyms do have a another gym i go to and it's not a particularly big gym it's not a uh, part of a big chain so i imagine those gyms are have much more facilities but my gym has a women's only space so if you're intimidated about being in the scam oh, that's awesome yeah yeah it's pretty good so they are safe and supportive spaces of my experience at least you know the middle section of aldi you will often find weights you'll find exercise equipment that you can do at home because i think you know gyms are brilliant i've been kind of sporadic mem i've had sporadic membership of gyms and it almost feels like you're part of a tribe which can be a bit intimidating to start with but i think for a lot of people now the thing thinking about kind of the cost. So you don't really need to, you don't need to spend money. Go, you can, uh, when I was visiting my parents in Ireland, they live in a very remote area. I just used bags of coal that I was kind of yeah. carrying, or, uh, you know, or tins of baked beans yeah. as well. A rucksack, a rucksack with weights in, tins, flour, bags of flour, they can get a bit messy. 
Yeah. Can't they? Small yeah. child, small dog. I have quite a lot of clients. I give like the dog, the bench uh, workout. <laughs> so when they're taking the dog for a walk, uh, they've got a 20 minute workout. They can do just lots of different exercises on a bench as well. It's got a place. It's definitely got a place. And just like we said with everything, educate yourself and see what it does. If you need a bit of motivation as to why to do it, have a little check into Stacey Sims. And I think as ever, if you know what, how good it's going to make you feel and how uh, easier it's going to make the rest of your training cycle, uh, you'll be more likely to stick to a program. We've got one more question from Emma Asprey, which we're just going to touch on a little bit, but I think we could go into more detail. She's asked for anyone whose periods have vanished for several years. She's put four to five years since starting to run. This might not be menopausal related. It might be, we don't know how old you are, Emma, but initially, I'm sure Siobhan's going to say the same thing to me. The first, you need to go and see your doctor ASAP. I think knowing her age, uh, knowing her weight, knowing the amount of training that she does, um, because it could simply be overtraining or it could be hormonally driven, such as polycystic ovarian disease, or it could be a premature menopause. But I think if your periods, if you're quite young and your periods are stopped for that amount of time, you definitely need to see a healthcare professional about that so they can unpick what's going on and arrange appropriate investigations and depending on the age kind of doing blood tests is, is actually very often really really useful whereas for most menopausal women you don't need to do blood tests once you're over the age of 45 but if she is young that's the first thing that I would be doing because if she's not having periods I'd be worried about her bone density I'd be worried about um, what's going on in the background that's triggering this so I agree yeah I would definitely sign poster to go and see her GP it's not a normal phenomena. It, there may well be nothing underpinning it, but it's sensible to to actually exclude lots of different different differentials there. As a female athlete, you want to be getting your period every month. It should be a stamp of I'm doing this right. I'm fueling my body well. My hormone levels are right. I'm carrying on with my cycle. So I'm always quite happy when I get my regular period because mm. it's like, yeah, I'm winning at this. You know, I'm able to carry on. I'm training really hard. I'm asking a lot of my body, but I am re uh, rekinding it, repairing it with, I'm fueling it well. I'm getting the balance about right. And I know I have lost my period a couple of times, and I know that's always been a big red flag to me that I've massively overdone it and I need to back off and I need to fuel more and I need to rest a little bit more. I've heard a lot of female athletes talk about this on various podcasts. They've uh, lost their period, and um, I think it was Tina Muir may have discussed it on her podcast uh, years and years ago. And uh, yeah, my goodness me. Seems to be quite. I think a uh, honestly, subject. when I was a teenage athlete and in my twenties, it was a sign. It was a badge of honour if you didn't have your period because it was great because it meant that you didn't have to deal with that. You were training really hard. You were really light and you were really fast. But now we're like that. It has so many catastrophic consequences in f our future lives that it, it's never ever a good sign. And Emma, if uh, yeah, get yourself down to your doctor and ask for explain your symptoms. Explain you're an athlete get yourself a blood test and hopefully you can uh, set yourself on a healthy pathway as well. Siobhan, thank you so much. Before we finish with the quick fire, before we move on to frivolous content, I'd just like to say thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast, sharing all that. And uh, gosh, I've learned lots. Gary, your mind must be blown, <laughs> Gary. <laughs> I hope some guys, you know, I do hope guys tune in and listen to this um, because a lot of the bone density stuff, that can be transferred to men too. It's not all just about women and uh, menopause. Quick five. Eddie and I, we're super tired. We come banging at your door. You're going to so feed us. And grumpy. And grumpy. So <laughs> <laughs> what is your signature dish? What are you going to serve up? Uh, Masselman curry. Oh, my best, my favourite. Wow, I love it. <laughs> Can we do a veggie option for that? Oh, yes. I even have um, got vegan massam and curry paste made up in the freezer as well, so... I can take it to that level. Goodness me, this sounds very yeah. good. <laughs> um, what time of day are you at your most productive? Midnight. <laughs> oh, no! Oh, no! Oh, my goodness me, I'm pretty anxious if I'm still at midnight. <laughs> I have two jobs, so I cram a lot in yeah. and... Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, the, the, I'm kind of, I peak usually at about midnight when I get all my great ideas and then it's like, God, yeah, <laughs> not great. <laughs> well, this, uh, it might be quite tricky to answer this one actually, but do you have a particular, uh, fond memory of a certain Christmas present that you've received at any point in your life? You go for this as well, Eddie. Do you remember any? 
Uh, I was given a PlayStation a few years ago that really wasn't for me. It was for my kids. <laughs> to me, like, great. thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Rubbish, but hopefully it might have given you a little bit of quiet time when they're on the plate. It did. Then worth its weight in gold and fairness. Yeah. I remember getting a Sylvanian house, village house. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Still is the best Christmas. Cool. <laughs> uh, I'm going to try and get in touch with you. Would you respond better if I phoned you old school or do you prefer WhatsApp? Probably WhatsApp. What's up? I'm getting scared if somebody calls we me call out of the blue. We call each other quite a lot, don't we, Gary? You're prob probably like, we do call each We like a chat. If it, there's a few chat. days goes past, I'll say, do you want a quick chat? <laughs> quick chat. <laughs> <laughs> All right, every uh, week we pop out the uh, podcast on social media. We'd like to put some music to it. You have the choice, Siobhan. What song or an artist I can uh, choose? I can, if you want, what, what song would you like? Such a varied taste in music at the moment i'm listening to, oh it's probably not kind of running running i've been listening to the forest gump soundtrack which has been quite um quite fun to run to yeah. um <laughs> I'm, I'm very much into acoustic kind of like um angus and julia stone i really like mm. um, i do love thin lizzy you know yes boys of there, that's it mm -hmm. going thin lizzy old school Fleetwood Mac, um, but then I like opera. Then I like The Cure. You know, I, I've a very I love music, and I, I do listen to a lot of music. And I'm getting podcasts made for me for the Northern Traverse because mm. it can take you on such journeys. And then I'll listen to classical, and it'll just make me bawl my eyes out. So yeah, I would say something like Thin Lizzy because yeah. number one, Irish kind of puts a grin on someone's face. To be quite honest, I had uh, music and earphones. Like I had like four sets of. Bluetooth earphones lined up for the spine that I was going to use to listen to and I didn't listen to anything. I listened to, uh, as I went over Crossfell, I had my phone in my top pocket and I put a podcast on that was just noise, that I just wanted to hear noise. I wasn't actually yeah. listening to what was happening. I just wanted voices to kind of keep me awake. But I never listened to any music. One, I think actually because my hands, I was suffering so much with the cup, they would, you couldn't fiddle, whereas in Northern Traverse, hopefully not going to be in minus 20 snow blizzards. So you've got more <laughs> dexterity to put music in. And also, I guess for the spine, it's so dark the last thing I needed with all my hallucinations was any noise, any extra music. <laughs> yeah. It just totally freaked me out. But again, I guess when you're traversing that lake district to some beautiful classical music, dancing, <laughs> over, the, um, I dancing think over the rocks. The lake district will be long gone when you need a distraction. <laughs> Yeah, that's the hardest part, that first 100K. And what's going to be really hard is that the first 100K finishes at Shap and that I will be passing by the back of my house and then I have to going past it. <laughs> I'm going to be a happy bunny. <laughs> you will. You'll have done it. You know, every yeah. bit there will be a little marker. So it'll be like, I've done that. Fingers bit. crossed. Fingers crossed. It's a big it's a big challenge and it's a lot to pack in with everything else in life. Yeah. But I'm going to give it a good Give it a go. Give Best it a go. What, what a game. journey. I love the coast to coast. It's a magical route, that. Mm -hmm. Well, fingers crossed I'll, I'll, I'll get to the, get to the finish we'll line. We'll be watching. We'll be oh, God, watching. no pressure. <laughs> no pressure. Everybody listens to this. Uh, Siobhan, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Just a little vignette of everything that um, uh, hopefully, if you sent in a question or you're a woman listening to this and it's inspired you to do a little bit of a little bit of research, a little bit of re education. Also, perhaps giving you a bit of courage, perhaps if you're feeling alone, to step up um, and go to your GP. You always, always ask, or just talk to a mate. Sometimes just sharing the way we feel can help us feel a bit better. Best of luck with the Northern Traverse and thank juggling you. a whole life. And thank you again so much for coming on the podcast. No problem. Thank you. Thanks. That was great. So much knowledge there. And I really do hope uh, our male listeners didn't all switch off because there was some little tips in there. The vitamin D, uh, magnesium, they could help uh, everybody. And what I will do is we discussed uh, there was two editions of the same book. Is that right? No, once, once but one, one, once but two. Okay, we'll pop the links for those the in. If you, the if you want Stacey Stims on uh, Instagram, and she does quite a lot of online courses as well on all sorts of things, not just on menopause, but all things female athlete related. Just follow her on Instagram if you just want a bit of daily education while you're digesting your social media over your cups of tea. Yeah, I thought that was great. Thanks, everyone.
Thank you so much, Siobhan. This week's Tales from the Trail, we've got a quite a few things coming in this week. I had a lovely uh, email from Richard Bulmer, who did the Challenger SAP uh, spine race, and he has written a poem. I'm going to read it out to you, Gary. This is really good. Ooh. An ode to the spine. The spine tingling adventure. My journey start, 7.30 a.m. Edale. Destination within 60 hours whores. Anticipation, pouring rain, hope and fears. Jacob ladder we step by step, ascend with determination, fastish. Friendships kindling with quiet nods, kinder snout, and the ghosts of trespass. A procession of head torch light, into the distance the leaders march, over the boulders to meet the first road, snake past, mist over bleak low beckons. The path turns to fast streams, morning has broken, the way ahead, the cold black peat squelches and sucks, knee deep in bog, pulling feet out of the dark. Poor side, we're on our way, T. Sixteen miles done, aid stop with smiles, volunteers like beautiful Pennine angels, less than a hundred miles to go, and good time done. Next up to climb Black Hill, but first the raging water crossings. Approach boldly to step into torrents, the cold water penetrates every sinew. Wessington Moor ahead, downhill and a determined job. The first reservoir is companion, the light fades and night's on for night. Darkness for 15 hours. Manchester's dancing lights, overlooking people oblivious. What strange things we do. Why? Blakely Calf, White Moss, Round Hill, Stand Edge, White Hill, Millstone Edge, High Gutter Moss, then to Nicky's Food Bar and a goddess. St. Nicky of the M62, purveyor of simple burgers, but much more with 32 miles done. Food, hot drink, warmth, smiles, love. The long slog to Hebden, thrashing hail and harsh wind, Stugley Pike with ups and downs, and down into Charleston. Respite. But first the sting, up through narrow lanes across dark fields of slidey mud, to reach the warm embrace of Hebden Hay. 48 miles done, tired legs. First sustenance of food aplenty, a brief slumber before preparations, more food, kit, kit check chaos, and into the night. Onwards into the dark, an old friend as companion, marching to the tune of progress, step by step forward, step by step. The first snow blizzard. Withens height inspired Bronte. The path slips and slides, the cold. It's relentless in the unforgiving night. Daylight at Pondon. Friends are falling, bowed. A new comrade found to progress. We hike, talk, stay silent, but together. Lothersdale Angels, Craven Tri-Club Aid Station. Over 60 miles and replenishment. Encouragement, food, hot drinks, more love. Onwards, hills and dales to Thornton and Craven, East Martin, Wilsonson Bridge and Gargrave. 72 miles and a place to regroup, buy supplies. Darkness again for me, tired and slow progress. Lost briefly to retrace steps, then to Malham and keep going. Up Malham Cove, endless steps to climb, rocky path to navigate carefully, then to see checkpoint 1.5, Malham Tarn. Open the door to an oasis, warmth, lights, restoration, easy conversation and laughter. Friend awaits to accompany into harsh night. First, the hard slog. Over fountains fell, snow line path and stillness. A mist envelops the hill hiding the way. Tiredness deepens. A brief nap at the top, just curl up for five minutes. It helps a little, oh, but for a bed. The majestic Penny Ghent, pitch black, no towering spire. Tonight, just uphill clamber in darkness. A frozen pinnacle reached to relief, not triumph. For Horton and Ribsdale, more warmth and love awaits with caving skills and compassion. Pot noodle, tea, sleep, pot noodle, tea, go. 14 miles to complete. Buckworth Moor and Cam Road. The march is now a determined plod. The sun glistens on the snow-covered dales. The end and smiles. Relief, peace, achievement. A happy photo, a medal, a seat, 180 miles, a journey, a metaphor. Wow. Wow, Richard, what a poem. Loved it. I was so creative, Richard. Kind of like they, I was reliving that. Yes. I was reliving all those bits I'd forgotten. Oh my God, the river crossings. I forgot about those bits. <laughs> what, a, what a great poem, Richard. Thank you so much for sending, well, writing that, sending that and sharing it. And I really enjoyed it. Reading it, could you tell I was pretending I was on Radio 4? Uh... You had your world service voice. <laughs> <laughs> you did a great job. I couldn't have done that. <laughs> any other, you got any other news? Uh, <clears throat> tales, tales, Gary? Yeah, we had an email. Um, 
I'm going to keep it uh, Northern and not BBC, <laughs> BBC standard. Uh, but yeah, let me find this. Uh, so when you were reading out your global listenership and got very excited that you had people listening all over the world, including Japan, that's me, exclamation mark. I absolutely love the show. I always save it up for my long runs. I'm by no means an ultra runner yet, but I find you and all the people in the UK running community so inspiring. And being a Brit abroad, it's lovely to feel like I'm sitting down with some friends for a chat every week, despite the fact the fact that I'm so far away. It's also encouraged me to start seeking out a running community here because I've always been a bit of a lone wolf. But the podcast helped me realize how social running can truly be. Last year, I completed my first half marathon in 155. Wow. Uh, yeah. Which was a massive, yeah. I love the, the the sub two. That was a big goal for me for a long time. Uh, so it's great to smash those numbers, um, which is a massive personal best. And this year I'm planning to run my first full marathon in October. So I'll be listening to you while I put in the miles and hopefully I'll have you nattering in my ears with a view of Mount Fuji and a nice copper. Thanks for everything. You said that, Gary, didn't you? Hey. Thank you, B. You said that, Gary. You're like, can you imagine there's people listening uh, able yeah. to see Mount Fuji? Hey, B, thanks so much. Love that. Yeah, I love that. Thanks, B. Over on the Strava Club. Ooh, Stephen Fairburn. 182 miles. <laughs> That's a heavy flex, Steve. Hang on a sec. Surely my Strava would have won uh, on the Strava Club last week. I don't think I got all the miles because my watch died. And <laughs> You had some bad watch admin, Eddie. I, had to, I know. I'm so, so disappointed. I think you can get your GPX from Open Tracker so that you get the whole route. Okay. But yeah. that's beyond my admin skills at the moment, to be fair. To be, to, and I kind of think, I kind of like the way it's all discombobulated. I've said that word twice. Because it's like, just sums up my spine journey of like, uh, we go, oh, it's died again. And then I get it back going again. I like that story. Uh, but Steve, yeah, you, Stephen Fairburn, 182.4 miles, uh, 32 hours. I wonder what he was doing. Georgina Lewis. Oh, some good climbing there. What are you training 22, for? 22,228. Wowzers. Wow. Thanks to all our followers over on Strong. Ah, oh, Steve was doing an accumulator. That is yeah. insane. That is so that last week, he's going to be doing 21 miles, 22 miles, 23 miles every day. It just it creeps up and creeps up. So that is, wow. Oh, my goodness. I love it. Love it, but also insane. Insanity. You okay, Gary? I'm feeling really down the dump, Eddie. I'll cheer you up. Do you know what I got? Got five star review. Yes. <laughs> Thanks to everyone who left review over on Apple Podcasts. Every so often, if I am feeling a bit down and dumps, I'll pop over there and just read a couple of them. We've got a lovely one here from Crypto Crypto Crimine. Crypto Tech Mean. Crypto Tech Mean, Tech Mean, Tech Mean. Best podcast. It is the best podcast. Oh, best podcast for your long run. Okay. I could write loads here <laughs> praising Gary and Eddie. But their heads... Oh, I hadn't read this. Hang on a second. Delete. I could write loads here. <laughs> delete, delete. I could write loads here, praising Gary and Eddie, but their heads are already big enough. What the devil? So just listen and subscribe, and you will know why once you have listened to your first episode. Thanks, Gary and Eddie. Thanks. Yeah, we don't... Yeah, we love it. Thank you. And we ask for those reviews because if you pop up a five-star review, you don't need to write a review, but if you just give us five stars, it puts the podcast um, up into it. If people are searching for perhaps a new podcast... Um, it puts it up there for them to listen to and uh, find the joy that we love spreading. McQuee, they're back. Just they're found back. out you're back. Automatic five-star review before I've even listened to a single second. That's the Hashtag... sort of review I like. That's, yeah, there we go. Don't Hashtag think. excited. Awesome. Thanks for that. So come on then. What is coming up, Edwina? Oh, you'll never guess what. This is worse <laughs> than your sad moment. Oh, it's in half term coming up, isn't it? Surely you've just had Christmas. Why do these children now need a two week half term? Yeah. This is not fair to poor Eddie. Literally, <laughs> I couldn't believe it when I turned for next week in my diary and I was like, you're having a joke. You're oh joking God. me. Anyway, kids are quite, they're quite tired, but that's not from school. They go to school to shut their eyes on the desk. It's from all the skiing. Um, and of course, we've got more skiing. Yeah, they'll ski a lot. So, but they ski a lot the first week. So my life will be driving them up and down skiing. And it's, so, Gary, I cannot tell you how busy. Every, there's quite a few people listening that probably come out here for a half-time holiday. Oh my gosh, it's apps. The place is 
Can you imagine in Wingate if suddenly you've got 30,000 people suddenly like this? Oh, just... my goodness. I get, and you know, you had a little bit of cyclist rage. I get the driving rage because people just walk in the middle of the road. Oh, so tourists they're... do that. Yeah. The tourists. And the kids are really bad. They are so, they're like, tourists, <laughs> tourists. They just step up. They're carrying their skis. I mean, why, when you hire skis, do you not get a lesson on how to carry your skis and poles? They do like skis, poles, kids everywhere. And they're just walking in the middle of the road. You're like, yeah. just trying to, just, you're so dangerous dangerous people go into this like lovely holiday mode which is fine they're on the holiday i've got to get over it so yeah, relax because... relax eddie <laughs> um so oh gosh so next next few weeks are going to be a bit of a juggle but it's fine stop complaining um i will do a little bit more skiing i'm going to get my uh touring skis my uphill ski skis i'm gonna put my feet into those i was a little bit resistant because i'm nervous about the ski down more but now i've skied a few times the legs are actually fine so i yeah. will do a bit of ski touring with the dogs light light training as we said but emotion is lotion 30 minutes every day and i'm beginning to think carrie about what i want to do next the end of this year can we reveal it? Anything? Do we... I think I'm going to save that for next week because only this morning I decided on what my next big race. I'm going to do another big race this year. This is 2024. No, no, this is going to be. I'm going to do another big race, but not till the end of this year. Okay. But there is going to be another one. I know. I know. Exciting. Exciting. So I'm. I also got to find if I can get an entry first. So I'm just going to think about that. You or know, is it, is, is it an oversubscribed event usually? Is it? Quite oh, popular? for sure. For sure, definitely. Oh my God, um, so I'm going to have to use my big head and go in. hundred? I would love that. But you'd be really sad when you like, I literally... Crush me. I crush you. <laughs> um, uh, so I, I just, I got the idea today. So I'm going to let that simmer. Like I said, no no big decisions. And uh, I'll, maybe I'll share that with you next week. Um, so yeah, hopefully continue the recovery. Be kind to yourself, Eddie. Be kind to yourself. Something else I really noticed is that I need to keep eating a lot. Yesterday, I really focused on more calories, snacks, lots of snacks, and I felt so much better. So I'm going to, that's my pledge to myself, continue the heavy snacking. Is anything gore? Or are you trying to have high quality food snacks? Uh Oh. You're still on the minstrels, <laughs> chugging the minstrels. You know, yeah, I do have chocolate every night before I go to sleep, which is probably the worst thing ever, but it's so good with that cup of tea. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm trying to have my yogurt, my protein. I've de it took me a week to be, do you know, it's a bit like I had really bad morning sickness when I had the kids and you don't want any fruit or vegetables or anything, just want beige food. So I felt yeah. like that for quite a few days. And then I had a veggie curry and I was like, this is good. So yeah. Focusing on the fruit, the vegetables, whole grains, and um, and protein, but also just like the see chips. Let's just eat those two. Oh, chips! Oh. It's always a good time for chips, isn't it? <laughs> Never a bad time for chips. What about you? What's the week? Oh, this looks exciting. I have got a marathon on Saturday. I think it's Saturday. I need to double check this because I don't want to turn up the wrong day. <laughs> <laughs> the Northeast Marathon Club, um, for club members, <clears throat> they quite often put on these free, it's awesome, free social event. It's classed as a marathon. So you can, if you people who are chasing, say, 100 marathons, 200 marathons, they can use it as an official event, which is good. And it really just uh, follows the north and then the south side of the River Tyne. And there's a tunnel which you can go under to and bridges, obviously. So it'd be quite nice actually run along the... Tyne, and if start and finish is right in the quayside, and if memory serves me well, maybe it's a Sunday. I'm not too sure, but I think there might be a market. There's on definitely the going to be treats around there. There's going to be yeah, yeah, some heifers. Well, that's what I'm visualising. I've been there once. I think it was a Sunday, and they had a, a nice market, but they had all these kind of hipster food stalls, like ten pound for a, a one of a, a, a veggie burger or something like that. But really, really tasty stuff. Um, not your kind of burger van that you'd see at a football match. It's a bit more. Hi. With a greasy burger. <laughs> Watch up, Gary. When was the last time you ran a marathon? Well, I'm pretty scared if I can do the distance. I did 14 miles all spread over two runs on Sunday. And yeah, I was feeling just, I think it's this kind of chesty cold, whatever I've got. I just uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> got no got no energy, but it would have been two to hell, Ellen, I suppose. So de December. Oh, not too long. I thought it was a bit longer than that. I think no, the no. key is just to keep eating through that. Yeah. But, well, I'll be hopefully staying with Ray and some other people in the group and just have a run, walk, social day out on the, on the key set. Super flat, but if I can, you know, I'm training for these 24-hour long events and obviously Dragon's Back, so if I could be out there for four, 
five hours. I don't really care. Just a big time on feet day. So looking forward to that. Be good. Thank you again to everyone who follows the show. And thank you again to everybody who left lovely comments about last week's podcast about my spine journey. I Hopefully, uh, I've replied to as many as I can, and I have read them all. Oh, it's so lovely. When you share a bit of your soul, and uh, I was nervous, as I said at the beginning, about it. So it was lovely if people have made the time to say that they enjoyed it and it meant something to them. Do you know, Gary, I have had a few inquiries, people wanting to run the spine uh, in the next few years. <laughs> like, so... I haven't put people off. There are people that have listened to that and gone, I want a piece of that. I love that. I'm all up for that. You listen to the worst story and then you go, oh, no, I want to do it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, um, sorry. Another news. I took my name in the lottery for the spine with my volunteer. Oh, uh, oh, I was going to ask you. So if you volunteer, you yeah. then you don't automatically get a place because obviously there's like you'd fill the race with volunteers. Yeah, basically. Yeah. So then what so then you get put in a lottery. Yeah, if you want to, you can put your as far as I'm aware, I didn't they didn't say I could only do it to a certain race. Um but so yeah, I'd put my name in the hat for the full spine in the lottery. And then also I think if you're I successful will kiss my pants if you get a place in the spine. I will enjoy that <laughs> so much. It's gonna be super tough, yeah. But you also get a discount code too. So I think um, okay. because I only did three or three and a half, four days, whatever, I wasn't the full five days. I think I get 10% off if I want to enter a okay. race. <clears throat> so yeah, sorry. Boy, sorry about that. I know, I love it. Okay, so thanks everyone. We'll go back to the beginning of that, our preamble. Thanks again to everyone who follows the show. Uh, over on Facebook, our little Facebook group is is growing. Love it, love that community. Over on Instagram, our Strava Club, and of course over on Patreon too. There is a link in the show notes that'll take you to all the places where you can follow along. Some great perks are now over on Patreon and we, we Gary, uh, hope to continue to build that with some more discount codes, as uh, discount code for Active Route and a discount code for Sports Shoes on there at the moment. So if you need some new kit or perhaps want to try Active Route. I haven't tried it yet, but I definitely want to. Head over to Patreon and take advantage of the discount codes. And of course, support Gary and I in our endeavor to become the podcast champions of the world. I'm loving our competition. When, when I thought of the idea for the competition, I didn't realize how warming, heartwarming it would be seeing all these lovely pictures of people out on their trails. So, yeah, yeah thanks. like a trail running buddy, is there? You have a yeah. special relationship with them. Really, really magical to see all of those uh, time shared on the trails with people. But if you're thinking, what are they on about? Basically, share a picture of you and your running buddy or buddies. It could be pets, doesn't have, it could be a four-legged friend. And, you know, you could be a lone wolf too. I don't want to, I thought, about. I was quite mindful afterwards. thought, you know, what about, I? 99% of my running is on my own. So if you just want to share a picture of a, a lovely trail, that is fine too. Everybody's welcome for this competition. And yet you could be in for a chance of winning a pair of lecky paws that retail about £150. So it's a really good prize. Again, thanks to Lecky for supporting this competition. I pinned the post to the top of the group, so check it out. Post in there. We're going to draw the competition or pick the competition winner on the 7th of February, and then we'll... Can we do it like they do on um, Britain's Got Talent and like American Idol, where they lay out the photos on a big desk and they have a camera over the top, and then they're like, yeah, you know, I really like that one because uh, <laughs> she's got like this vibe that's going on there. And then you go, oh, no, no, I'm totally against that. And we could like live it and people could see you can do that Eddie. i can do that <laughs> we should just have a look oh yeah thanks and get get entrance cry <laughs> It'll be a joint decision, though. It'll be a joint decision, and we will take our time, and we'll look through everyone, and we'll probably get a top three each, and then we'll go from there. So, yeah. Oh, I just I should say the only rules are you need to be a member of our Facebook group to be in. I don't think you're posting it unless you're a member, are you? Oh, I don't know. There's enough people trying to sell T-shirts. Oh, God, bloody T-shirts. Yeah, every time I feel like we should go, okay, yeah, please. Yeah, I do need to say, if there's any merchandise being sold, it will be me or Eddie pushing it, promoting it, sorry. Um, not some random from the Facebook group. We are having a bit of problem, a bit of a problem situation. Yeah, with... Because I don't want to put it as a closed group where you have to ask to join because I want people yeah. to go if they want to go on it. So, uh, But people and are I... pretty good. I get a ping on my phone that says so-and-so yes. has recorded a post and I delete it straight away. Yes. So, yeah, any merch, it'll be me or Eddie that is sharing it in the group. It's some merch in the pipeline, but it's not clothing. Because we're green. There is, yeah. Super excited actually to announce it if and when it <laughs> if and when it happens. <laughs> These good things take their time, Gary. Good things take their time. Thanks everyone for listening. And that was episode eight of the Teen Trails podcast. 
continue to run wise, run well, don't overdo it, <laughs> and make sure you refuel with coffee and tea. Don't. I didn't put coffee in specifically <laughs> because... It's this is tea and trails. If I wanted to drink coffee, I'd have made a podcast called Coffee and Chat. My name's Gary Thwaites. I'm Eddie Sutton. And that was episode eight of Tea and Trails. <laughs>